What we're doing. Today is kind of, at least, technically, what I refer to as paper day. So, you turn in your papers, hopefully, hopefully, by now. Okay. I don't think that's true of everyone, which is a problem. Anyway, um, so what I like to do the, the class after that, uh, fairly low stakes, I'm not going to ask you guys to do anything super intense, right? Uh, now also that said, because we turned in the paper, we're kind of, we're starting a new unit, we're not kind of, we are. This is unit two, this is critique. It is very similar to what we've been doing, okay? Um, the way I talk about critique, and I guess I'll bring up the prompt to do this. Um, the way I talk about critique, it's a two-step process. The first step is everything we've been doing. It's everything we've been doing. So specific details from the text, uh, what are their rhetorical implications, right? If you think back to uh, the social dilemma, it's like, sorry, so much shit is turning on in my face, it's crazy. Like that keeps blinking, it's, it's really, I don't know who that's for. Anyway, um, but like with the social dilemma, you think about uh, any of the scenes with Isla that we focused on, right, you pick out a detail, you talk about what the rhetorical effects are, that's step one. That still needs to happen on this paper, okay? Step two is what we're gonna focus on. Uh, and of course, like I said, what I've heard from first is prompt to do that. To begin with, because some people get confused, I just want to illustrate very quickly. This is course 10, hopefully that's not new information. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Um, here's our page, and look, already, just to be clear, I clicked on content, I don't know why it does this, this is actually not super helpful. It just takes you to the last section you were in. So because uh, the last thing I did on our page I suppose would upload our video last week. That's where it took me. And I think sometimes you get you guys get lost. You're like, I don't see. So find this navigation menu, right? <coughs> That's unit one, which is where we are no longer. And you scroll, in this case, the unit two. This is us. We got our prompts, rubric, all that jazz, uh, videos forthcoming, and then homework. Right? Same as unit one, just you know. Different. Anyway, let's talk about the prompt. Mm -hmm. Alright. Okay. The length. Three pages this time, not two to three. Uh, and again, at least all the papers I've looked at thus far, uh, I've only, you know, sort of gotten uh, waist, deep, waist deep into those, but everybody seems to be okay with the two pages this time, three. I think we can do it, right? 25% of your grade, which is intimidating. Uh, MLA format, pretty standard. Um, and again, for the most part, you guys have done well with that. The only issues I've seen, it's either you mostly nail MLA, or honestly, I'm not sure if you even thought about it. Like, there's no in-between. So if you didn't mostly nail MLA, it's, it's shit like you didn't even bother to, to fix the font, or indent paragraphs, or like, you know, like weird, stuff. All I'm going to say is spare a thought for the formatting. It is worth some points. Not a lot, but easy points, right, to just get. So do that. Uh, source text. There's two videos this time. You pick one. I want to stress that. Pick one. Please, please do not write about both. I want to give you a choice. So there's a John Oliver video, which we're going to talk about today, and uh, an episode of the Joe Rogan <coughs> podcast from a couple years ago. Uh, I'm going to uh, underscore for you here. You do not have to listen to the entire thing. His episodes are like two to three hours a piece. You don't have to do that. You can if you want. Most people don't take me up on that. They're, they're, uh, on the syllabus, I've delineated like a half hour chunk, okay, that you listen to. There's timestamps. You go there, you listen to that. That's all that, that I'm requiring of you. Anyway, you pick one of those and you critique it. And this brings me to talking about all that, which is there for you if you want. As I mentioned before, uh, I pulled the prompt up. First part of the process is exactly what we've been doing, okay? It's rhetorical analysis. The new part, <clears throat> the twist, I suppose, you take that rhetorical analysis and you critique it. I'm curious what you guys think that means, to critique something. 
or if you're if you're critical, right? That's, that's where we get these terms. What does it mean if you're critical of a thing? What do you think? <laughs> Nicely put. Anybody else? Like if you tell a friend they're being critical, how do you normally mean that? Great. You guys are my talkative class, I suppose, well. Really? Sarcasm. Uh, All right. Um, I mean, you're not wrong, but I was trying to get somebody to say, I mean, at least in my experience, this is what you guys will also say. Uh, we have this idea that criticism is is negative usually right if you say that a person is critical you don't normally mean it as a compliment all of my ex-girlfriends actually anyway that's a true story um and there is that <clears throat> you can offer a negative critique oh god I don't know. you can offer a negative critique but what's important and this is uh Again, this is sort of part of your definition. You can offer a positive critique as well. If you feel like, for instance, we're gonna talk about Oliver here in a bit, if you feel like some certain aspect of whatever he's done is effective, like works well, well, you can still be critical of that, but you're doing it in a positive way. This is how it's working rhetorically, just like we've done. And then, and given that, this is why it's successful, basically, okay? But again, the inverse is also true. This is, where, uh, this is the thing Oliver is doing rhetorically, this is how it affects the audience, and because of that, this is why it negatively impacts whatever argument he's trying to make. That's all we're doing in this paper. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Does anybody have any questions at this stage? Cool. Let me update the attendance real quick. Um, Jaden came in, and hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, <coughs> Bailey, mm -hmm. fuck yeah. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> what I want to do now, ooh, I don't want to ruin the surprise. Um, very briefly, I know, I have to have my own fun. Uh, very briefly. I'm going to show you guys an example text before we get to John Oliver, because I have a sneaking suspicion, given my experience, that not all of you watched the Oliver video for today, which is a bummer. Um, so we're going to watch the thing first. Before that, I want to ask you guys, when it comes to critique, there's a couple things we got to think about. The first thing, aim an audience, okay? What this means is, what is the text trying to accomplish? And who is the text directed at, right? So for instance, if you've ever, for whatever reason, watched an episode of like Matlock or something, okay? Really anything that comes on TBS during the day, if you ever watched that, and you thought to yourself, this show sucks. Well, it's probably not made for you, right? Has anybody ever for, like, been homesick and like watched an episode of a soap opera and not been thoroughly impressed? Again, it's probably not for you, right? It's for a certain kind of person. Well, that's the audience. You have to consider what a text is actually trying to do <coughs> and who it's trying to work on to, to assess it fairly, you see? So aim an audience is the first bit. The second part of the operation, and again, I'm giving you all these fancy terms today. I was like, Jesus Christ, somebody else coming in. Criteria and standards. This sounds much fancier than it is, okay? All this means, like a, like a standard, how do you know something is good, right? Like when it comes to sports, we know, uh, at least one of the ways we know a, a player is good, we have stats, you know? And if you go on Twitter, especially any sports Twitter, and you're like, I think this guy's the best, you are guaranteed to get people telling you all the ways you're wrong, and they're gonna pull out stats, right? Well, this guy has per game, right? Those are standards. Those are certain criteria and standards we use to measure those players. That applies across the board. That applies to any kind of a text, okay? So here's what I'm gonna ask you guys about. I want, I always try to think about what kind of text you guys might 
know well enough to have this discussion. And it's also got to be something short. It's got to be something we can talk about in class. So I want you to think about this. When you go to the movies, which I know, you know, I don't even know if you guys do that anymore. Do you guys go to the movies? We stream most things, right? Like it's kind of... I think we still have access to the text I'm thinking about. I'm not actually thinking about movies. I'm thinking about movie trailers. So, I mean, for instance, uh, there's one coming out soon uh, made by the guy that made the movie Knives Out. I don't know if you're familiar. Excellent movie. Called Glass Onion. And my wife saw the trailer the other day because I watched football. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I am meant to tell you. And we sat down and we're like, that was fucking good. Like, we, we, it's one of those, you watch the trailer, and you, if you're not familiar with this term, movie commercial, right, is what it is. You sit down and watch the trailer, minute and a half, two minutes, right? They're always short. That's one of the criteria. If you uh, if you saw a trailer and it was like eight minutes long, you'd probably be kind of upset, right? But it sells you on the film. It gets you excited, right? Like that's its aim. And I want to ask really quickly, other than brevity, other than it being short, how do you guys know a movie trailer is any good? Like what about it, do you think? What kinds of things matter? Yeah, but like, sure, sure, and, and again, that's part of its aim, and it needs to do that, but we, we gotta take like half a step back, like, and it may help if, if you guys are thinking of it right now, if you saw one recently that maybe did this, like, what, could you try to think about, could you try to pinpoint what is it about it that did that, right? Like, for instance, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you guys, the Glass Onion trailer we're talking about, I cannot recommend Nines Out enough, that movie is awesome. Uh, Glass Onion, which I'll admit is kind of a goofy title, I'm fine with it, has a sick cast. The cast is incredible. Yeah. It is nuts. And they, and they know this, right? They show you the names and you're like, fucking he's in it and she's in it? Holy shit. Like, it's like, it's really like, it can be part of, uh, I suppose, the captivation process, to borrow your term. Uh, so cast could be part of it, right? What else, though? Or, I mean, another way to think about this, and this can sometimes be helpful, have you ever seen a trailer and you left thinking, what the fuck, that was terrible. Like, why, why, did, why is that what they decided? And again, can you think of any, like, specific aspects that, like, make a trailer bad or, or less successful, I suppose? Yeah. Good. I just got a little bit upset thinking about this, even if it, like, directly... Uh -huh. um, there's no other word other than like spoils the yeah. like plot of the film. Yeah. Like I'm thinking of um, the last episode of Star Wars where they're like, oh, by the way, that dead guy, he's back. But like, read the trailer. Oh, the yeah. Emperor? Yeah. They dropped yeah. that in the trailer of all things. I'm like, that's that's like a huge bombshell that would have been like at least a little bit normally relevant if you would have yeah. seen it in the movie. I didn't know that. That's. No, they do it in the trailer. And, oh, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I'm, that's pretty bad. I don't, don't want to get on that. No, I feel you. No, that, I mean, yeah, that's pretty bad. I mean, you'll hear a similar thing with comedies when, like, and this is, all the good jokes are only in the trailer. Yeah. You know? Like that. But to be fair, that makes the trailer actually probably look great, but the movie itself suffers. But yeah, yeah, I feel like I saw another hand. That's a good one. Did I make that up, the other hand? Anything overly cliche. Okay. Get, like, could you try to give us an example? Any Hallmark trailer. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Either. Any Hallmark trailer. Oh, well, see, I wonder now. I mean, yes, but if we're fair, if we're fair to the trailer, think about aim and audience. Fair point. Who's watching those movies and why? Old people because they're bored. Yeah, and I kind of think, at least, because I've seen a couple of those, right? My, my mother's favorite TV channel is Lifetime. Ooh. <laughs> I know, um, but I, I, I feel like they want cliches, right? They must. Because they've pumped those movies out. Tori Spelling has a second career, like, as a result of these movies. Like, they, they, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I almost wonder if, given those, that particular uh, criteria, standards, all that, if they might be successful. If, like, the snow is falling and the 30-something uh, uh, the white guy is, like, back on his feet, like, maybe early in the trailer he's unshaven, but, like, at the end, when he's clearly successful, he's clean-shaven and he's got a button-up on, and the family's together, right? And it's, like, it's, I think that's successful for what it is, right? 
but fair point. Conversely, if it was, I hate to put it this way, a real movie, and it was like that, you would you would have questions. You'd be like, are they what what is this? What why are people in this movie? What is happening? Right? So it, good. Yeah. I think um something that like might play action movie trailers in specific is there's too much where they're just like trying to show you like the spectacle of different stuff that's going on. Yeah. Like yeah. Not all of them, but like maybe some of the Marvel movies where it's like, oh like this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen. It's yeah. like big like CGI scenes where you're seeing lots of different stuff going on, but it's not driving like it's almost not coherent. Well, it's, and it's not like driving some sort of like plot or narrative forward. It's yeah. Like, oh, I wonder what's happening. It's like, oh no, it's like uh, Captain America punching dudes or something. I don't yeah. Know. I can't think of a specific example. No, I, no, I mean, I, I feel you on that. I feel like most of us have been exposed to something like that. I actually, you remind me of a somewhat related thing, and this is kind of on the cliche tip. It's, um, I can't remember exactly what it was because they're forgettable. That's the problem. It's so cliche, they're forgettable. But like, my wife will occasionally have us go to see a movie, which is fine. Um, but uh, you know, we'll be in there. And the cool thing about it, I actually like previews. I like sitting down for previews. Oh, previews. It's cool, yeah. Great. I mean, you get bombarded and when they're good, it's great. And when they're trash, it's great in a different way. But you'll see two or three back to back that legit all, all run this way, like, in a world. I can't believe he would do that. We're people. Like, you know, like it's it's so overly uh, dramatic, right? Melodramatic, I suppose is the term, um, that you, you never even attempt to buy the movie, like think that it could be good because you're so floored with how awful this trailer is. Um, that happens all the time, you know? Good. So I say all that to say, we do this. Uh, you see a trailer, its aim is, it is trying to sell you on the movie. It, it wants you to watch that minute and a half, two minute thing and go, I want to sit down for an hour and a half, two hours and see how this plays out. Well then, and it's great that the sun's out now, that might impact the quality a bit. We're talking about a movie, specifically a trailer, and it is I guess two and a half minutes, which is about as long as a trailer can be. Okay, but I, I think that's still acceptable. This is a movie called Birdemic. It came out a hot minute ago. Um, uh, I, I want to be very cautious with what I tell you about it, actually. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, because that, that's how you see trailers. You just see them. You know, they, they kind of come up unasked. Uh, I checked the volume, it should be okay. If it's not, I'll fix it as we go. But uh, yeah, let's just see what happens. So to the best of your ability, we're gonna watch this, judge it, because you will. Believe me, you will. <laughs> but also, specifically, for good or ill, why? What about it is successful or unsuccessful? A movie that came out shockingly recently. It was, uh, it was on Netflix, my wife and I tried to watch it once. We got like an hour deep and we couldn't watch it. <laughs> an hour, it's, that movie couldn't be longer than an hour and a half. It's like an hour and a half, two hours. I just it's 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 it. It. I looked at the, uh, the producer, the filmmaker, the filmmaker for it. Yeah. And apparently, because I thought it was very familiar, there's four more. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I know he made some sequels. There, there it's like the Sharknado series where it's just so horrendous and bad. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that, I mean, that's an important question that we could, we could ask at a certain point, but, but, all right, so you guys seem to have some thoughts on the trailer. We can start generally, if you like, because uh, that's, yeah. What, uh, what do you guys think? What do you, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Here and then there. Were those birds CGI'd in? Yeah. Funny story about that. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, funny story about that. And again, the, the, the film is kind of old. This particular YouTube video has been up for 12 years, so... You know, um, but when the guy made the movie, he just ended up not paying the guy that was making the birds. And so when he went to finish the film, all he had was like the stand-in stuff that the guy gave him before he like finished the animation. So that's why. It was gonna be better than that. I mean, it had to be, right? It had to be better than that. Well, um, but well, hold on, real quick, hold on, because we're gonna hear it here. Let's talk about that. That's an important question. Talk to me about the birds in Birdemic. 
We only see them, I mean, really, for probably 20 seconds. What's your opinion of those? Most of the mission definitely brings down. Good. Yeah. Why? Why? Like, can we pinpoint, uh, for, for instance, this is clearly meant to be what kind of a movie? I hope it's satire. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amazing. It's a horror film. Not, not even trying to hide the fact that it's heavily based on Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, if you're familiar with that movie. That was before CGI, fun trivia about that, it's about birds who attack. Alfred Hitchcock uh, tied birds to strings and tied those strings to the actress. So her fear is real. That's awful. <laughs> different time, <laughs> very different time. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the quality of the animation, other than bad, because we got that, how else might we describe it? The, that's like the famous still of them like standing there swatting at them. Yeah. Just like the basically the gifts of birds just flying Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like going <laughs> bird screech dot wab. Like and one of them like, has a, a coat hanger. And yeah, like, they all have coat hangers. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So it's um the animation quality is so poor, right? That what gets damaged? If the aim of the film is horror, like he he wants to scare you. How does this work against that? It's hilarious. Yeah. It's not believable. If you cannot believe the monster, and we had kind of had this old cliche with like really old horror films, like, oh, I can see the zipper, like sort of thing. If that happens, if you see the zipper essentially, which is what this is, you're no longer afraid. It's just like a doofus in a suit, or in this case, animation that like that like I did. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's terrible. And it's hilarious, right? Which is not what they're after. If this were a comedy, I think this trailer would be stupendous. Like, they nailed it. <laughs> but it's not. So this would obviously be a negative critique. The, uh, the quality of animation. Um, you can't take it seriously. Uh, damages, this is a weird way to think about it, but it damages the credibility of the product. A good horror film has to be credible. Like, the the danger that the characters are in, or like the pacing of the plot has to be credible. The moment you don't believe it, it doesn't work anymore, right? Easy body paragraph right there about the credibility of the animation. Yeah, good. Uh, you had something a minute ago, I'm sorry. Um, just them including the god awful dialogue throughout it. Dude, I, I always forget. <sighs> I mean, some of the dialogue is pretty. What, are you thinking of anything in particular? Uh, yeah, like the um, whatever the boss was talking to him, the very first scene. I mean, it's just yeah, it's so raw, and motionless. One million dollars. Well, and again, so so there's there's a question here. It's either because sometimes the dialogue is pretty cringy. My personal favorite is at some point when the guy was writing it, he had to have thought to himself, "All right, I need to like involve some real world." So, you know, so he arrives at like climate change basically, and there's a, a dude in a mask for just a second, like on a dock or something, and he says, uh, these birds aren't the problem. You know, man is the real dangerous animal. <coughs> like, man, just shoehorn some morals into this movie for me, right? Like, yeah, so, so th that dialogue is so bald on its face, right? So overtly trying to make the movie into more than it is. Again, damages with it or uh, you don't believe it. It doesn't sound like the way a human being would speak, you know? Conversely, uh, you guys are talking about dialogue. I also think you're, you're mostly focused on just how shitty the acting is. Yeah. It's really bad. The main character, the dude, is so muted. Like, so... And some people are like that, and that's fine. But maybe you shouldn't be in films. You know, like, he's so... One million dollars. Or is it, his friend is actually even better. He goes, wow. <laughs> um, and I feel so bad. I, I never remember until we watched the trailer. The girl, I think, can kind of act. She's the only one in the movie who can kind of act. And damn well, it, if she's, not, she's in this. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. 
So again, that would be another body paragraph on, and, and, and just like we did with uh, the social dilemma, to the best of your ability, you want to pinpoint just what you're talking about. We could talk about dialogue for sure. But in that, uh, in that case, you would be talking about like the quality of the writing, whether or not it seems believable for like a human being conversation. Um, or if we're talking about how those lines are delivered, in this case, by the actors who, I don't even know if you would call most of these people actors, right? Like it's just, uh, it's, like a, it's like a student film. It is. Well, and I love to, and this, I, I don't, this could never go into a paper, probably if you were writing about this trailer, but, at one point, they list uh, the director's accolades. Like one of them is like, I'm not going to get it verbatim, but it's like from the uh, genius uh, of the romantic thriller, right? At one point, that's a movie he made before this. He just made a movie called The Romantic Thriller. But because of how it's delivered in the trailer, it makes it sound like, oh, this guy's like a master of the genre. No, he's just a jackass. Um, he also misrepresents quotations, so toward the end, like what, my favorite, my personal favorite, is this the next uh, John Carpenter? That's a real quotation, he does not misquote. But the guy that wrote that goes on to say, no, because this movie's awful. <laughs> but he just took that, right? Like, wow. Anyway, um, good. I want to ask this, it's fine if we can't answer it, but I, I want to ask, honestly now, you may have to dig deep, take a second, are there any like positive critiques we could offer? I guess I kind of gave one a minute ago, yeah. Um, the camera quality, like if you're tracking the, the photography. It's, it's like, shot, you know, like there, there's some, uh, oh, I'm going to dust off my it's bag. Not three year olds only <laughs> there's, some, there's some blocking going on with like how characters are centered and, and yeah, okay, with the, with like the dialogue, but the the shot composition and the color grade and the like actual like resolution of the Well, I mean, to to be fair too, the movie is super old. Yeah, but it's uh, shot like it's Twilight. Also, what it's color graded like it's Twilight. Yeah. yeah exactly. I think like, I think I think like some of that is due boring. to having like I mean, I'm I'm trying to be devil's advocate a little bit. Just a little bit. Um it's low budget. Right, but it's obviously low budget, so it's hard to. 2010. No, no, no I'm not saying, but it's older and it's low budget, so you gotta just you gotta you gotta tread lightly on like film quality. Okay. I, I I buy what you're saying for sure. The guy is a trash, like everything. Like I'm with you, but I'm just saying. All right. The only I guess the only positive would be yeah, like it's not complete ass in terms of the cinematography. And again, I think if you go back and watch it, and some of you might, some of you might show friends, um, the, the actress is okay. And you gotta think about this too, like she's surrounded by all the things we just talked about. She's all right. She does an all right job. That's hard. That's hard to do. Um, so maybe that would be a positive critique. All right, what I wanna do now. Time. Oh, yeah. So this is one of the videos we can uh, write about for this paper. Again, you were supposed to have watched it. I hope that you did, or the next 40 minutes are gonna really suck. Um, for next time, you're doing the Rogan Packman thing, I'll try to save a little bit of time at the end to talk about that. Um, this video, it's all about public shaming. Um, what is that? Well, what Oliver's talking about, this is kind of, the way I've structured this semester, we talk about the social dilemma to start with, and that is, you know, probably a little bit alarmist, but all the ways that all these experts feel like the media, especially as prevalent as it is on phones, the way that it's like potentially harmful to society, right? And from here on, I want to just get way more specific. So rather than all of social media and all the ways that it might be doing things to us, this is a super specific aspect this is, he calls it public shaming. Uh, you may also uh, have heard it referred to as like outrage culture, uh, cancel culture, you know, you'll hear those terms thrown around. And he goes on for 26 minutes about what it is, why he thinks it's bad, which again, you may have heard before, but he also talks about why he thinks it's good, like that it's not all negative. In a way, he kind of gives a critique 
of cancel culture, essentially, right? And like how it works. And at one point he talks to a pretty famous person. Uh, I'm not gonna mention who that is because if you watch the video, you know, and if you don't, God damn it. Um, anyway, what I'm interested in today, just the same way we talked about social dilemma, okay? We're gonna watch a little bit. Uh, and I mean that, it's only 26 minutes, so like a little bit. And we're gonna think about specific aspects. Just the same way we talked about the trailer a minute ago, right? And you guys were you were ready with those, right? It was kind of easy uh, for you to think about all the ways that trailer sucked, basically. Um, ideally, you don't feel like this is absolute trash, like Birdemic, but uh, a, a similar eye. Anything that stands out to you, like, oh, that's an interesting thing that just happened there, or like this thing he said, or the way this was shot, you get it. Specific details. Um, we're going to talk about them. We're going to try to start the process of critique. Cool. Public shame, or as we call it in England, parenting. <laughs> Thanks to the internet, it has never been easier to pile onto a public shame. In fact, it's now one of America's favorite pastimes. The Wisconsin family's photo shoot's gone viral, and now it's sparking some outrage online. A viral video. Outrage on Long Island. Now the outrage over another viral video. The outrage machine never seems to rest. As actress Sarah Michelle Gell found out, some people online are just looking for an excuse to be angry. Well, what did Sarah Michelle Gellar do? I'm already so angry about it. Actually, don't tell me. I just realized I definitely don't care. Okay. Super short. But just almost like a little warm up. <laughs> I'm just curious. Anything at all? Because there's a couple things that have happened already from the from the jump. Anything stand out to you guys? Yeah. Um, every single news story is for outrage. Yeah, and it's all, and again, that's that's part of why when I introduced it to you guys, I mentioned like that phrase. It's become the sort of thing. <clears throat> I mean, again, in, in fairness to all those like news anchors. That is kind of how we describe this uh, sort of social machinery, right? That like outrage culture, you know, I mean, it makes sense. But it's also like buzzworthy, do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's the thing that everybody says, it's how everybody talks about it. To the point where, especially when you see a rapid fire like that, I mean, you tell me, but like the way I read it, it almost doesn't mean anything at a certain point, right? To just hear it over and over. That said, it's an interesting decision, right? Um, this clip opens with maybe 10 seconds of him talking, and then we immediately cut to the, the news coverage with all the people saying all the stuff about outrage. What's the effect of that, do you think? There's a couple different ways to read that. What do you, what do you guys think? Another question might be, and this could be an important question, why do you think they decided to do to cut to all those news guys doing their news stuff, talking about outrage. Whoa. <laughs> like, what is it? What does it accomplish? What does it tell the viewer? It does tell you some things. It's maybe substantiating that, like, they're talking about it. That it's a thing, yeah. right? That, you know, no matter your personal experience, because we all have different personal experiences, uh, this is like a worldwide phenomenon on some level. It's a concern. People are talking about it. It is real. Yeah. That's not a bad way to start a conversation about a thing. Just like, hey guys, this exists, right? Okay. Do you think he might have any other aims? Especially, and I'm leading you a bit here, especially if you think about how he ends the clip we just looked at. How does this clip end? Uh, no, 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 I'm just saying, I'm saying the clip we looked at, not the whole clip. Oh. Yeah. Who's on screen right now, other than John Oliver? If anybody? Some, some person I've never seen before. <laughs> yeah. She was famous once. She was in a show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer when I was in middle school. Oh, and you were in middle school? That show crushed. When was that? A long time ago. 
Long time ago. Nineties. Late nineties. Long time ago. Nineties. Ninety-five. You guys weren't alive. Ninety-five. Anyway. It wasn't. Anyway, I'm I'm speaking relatively. Sure. Point is, sure. what does he say about Sarah Michelle Gellar, who you guys have never heard of? I really don't talk. care. Yeah, he's like, what does she do? Oh wait, no, I don't care. Because it was momentary outrage, and then he fell into that. So on the one hand, he could be illustrating uh, sort of an aspect of, and I, I actually I hate calling it outrage culture. Like that feels really cheap. That doesn't, you know, that can't be a better name. That's, that feels even worse. Shitbag culture. Yeah. What it, but anyway, the point is, we'll, we'll get away from that for a second. The point is, you, you could say he's illustrating like the ephemerality at the heart of, that means short-lived, at the heart of uh, how this stuff works. Like we do generally get to, we're super upset at a person or a corporation or whatever for like a week. And then we just move on, you know, right after this. Twitter cycle. Yeah, well, right after this, he's going to talk about a goldfish, you know, and like, because they famously don't have memories. Um, but why, here's the interesting question. Why do you think he follows all that news coverage, which they're the ones that mention Sarah Michelle Gellar. He doesn't bring her up. They do. Why do you think he follows all that with <coughs> the I don't give a shit, basically, statement? Because that's kind of interesting. We said on the one hand, he, he had all this news coverage to say, this is a real thing, it's something that all these people are talking about, so maybe we should too, okay? But you could also say he for sure undercuts that message here, right? Why do that, do you think? I think something else is going on. Saying, what does Sarah Michelle Geller do? Oh, actually, I don't care. She's showing how relevant all this is. What happened? She's showing how irrelevant all this is. All what is? Okay. Is that more? Is that along the lines of what you're going to say? I was just saying he did it to like let you know what his stance is going to be on it. Sure. Yeah, and that I suppose that happens to be his stance. If we uh, explore that a little bit, like basically what's happening is, on the one hand, we have the news coverage to say this is a real thing that goes on. At the end, he, you could argue, further substantiates that by sort of illustrating how it. That it's a it's ephemeral in nature, which is also true. And on the other hand, he sort of points at how, yeah, I mean, if you think about like your day to day, real world lived experience, how relevant is any of this to any of us? You know, who gives a shit if Kanye West is crazy? He, he might be. <laughs> who cares? The people around him should care. People that he interacts with should probably care. Everybody else buys out and don't fucking the shoes, I don't know, like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, right? I do think is kind of the gist uh, of what Oliver is saying here. Why do you think he's doing that? Another question would be, we can skip that for a moment if you like, what is the effect of that? Of kind of very, very briefly building up the importance of cancel culture, outrage culture, whatever you like, uh, and then sort of chopping it down super quick here, saying that it's not super relevant, right? What's the effect of that? I'm with you there. How so? And it always kills a joke when you diagram it, but what's funny about it, do you think, that you can try? Because he leaves the alarm like he's a tree of serious and like, mm. oh God, what's going on? It's like, actually, I really don't care. It's just like, uh, I, don't know, I don't know the specific term for that. Well, I mean, it's, it's surprising. The, yeah. Almost any good joke, like that, on some level, at its heart, is surprising. It's not expected, right? I, I, uh, we went to see a, a comedian actually this weekend. And yeah, like most of the time, the punchline, if you see it coming, it's not funny, right? That's kind of the deal. So yeah, I mean, on the one hand, and what's super interesting there is, he is gonna talk about this for half an hour. <laughs> but he starts the whole thing with, ah, but it's not really a big deal, right? Like that's, that's a hard sell, a minute in. That'd be worth thinking about when it comes to a critique. I think you could actually go super hard positive 
if you think it's like funny, and this is a comedy show, by the way, we're looking at. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a comedy show that tries to, at times, be serious. We're gonna see a woman cry at a certain point. That's not super funny. If it is, keep it to yourself, Jesus Christ. But like, so he's trying to, he's trying to toe this balance. He's trying to talk about serious things while also being kind of funny, right? Kind of light at times. And I think our critique is going to hinge on how does he nail that balance. Good. Anything else you guys notice? There's one thing in particular. Actually, well, actually, here, I'll play for a second. It's going to come. Oh, there. 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 What is that? Big dog, bro. bro. Well, I mean, yeah. It's, I suppose he does. Um. Talking about anything on the screen, I can see three things right now. Pointing, special A. Okay, so the graphic up here. Let's think about that. I don't know what you're trying to point out. Of That's all right. No, look, half the screen, thereabouts, is taken up by this public shaming graphic, uh, which is both the title of the segment and that graphic's gonna come around a lot. So it's for sure important. Anybody have any thoughts on that guy? It alludes to the Scarlet Letter, which is... Good! How literary of you. Yeah, so the special A, as you called it, is the Scarlet Letter, which we've all read. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an alright book. He has a better one called Blythedale Romance. Anyway... Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. Don't worry, yeah, don't. <laughs> Different conversation. Anyway, um... Can somebody very, very quickly give us the gist of the Scarlet Letter? Don't be a whore. Don't be a whore. Well, that's the moral. <laughs> the gist is, yeah, a uh, woman in uh, puritanical New England um, uh, gets uh, accused of being an adulteress. Uh, so she has to wear a red A so that everywhere she goes, everybody knows that she's an adulteress and they don't treat her well as a result. It's kind of the gist. So that's pretty interesting that that's kind of set off like that. We can think more about that. Is there, are there any other elements in the graphic we should also consider? There's one big one. Yeah, all the pointing. They're all pointing at the title. Why are they doing that? That's pretty easy. Well, to show, again, to sort of... Um, well, yeah, well, it's illustrating how the thing works, right? Public shaming, by its very nature, is the public shaming like one entity. So it's going to be a lot of fingers pointed at one thing. What do we do with that scarlet letter? And this will be difficult for anyone who hasn't read the book or is unfamiliar otherwise. Because um, there's there is a moral, but it's actually not don't be a whore, right? It's not. It's not. What's the whole point of that book, if anybody had seen your lid where you were taught this. Nobody knows? I didn't read it, bro. Oh, it's just fucking famous. Anyway, well, I mean, I look, the moral is this. The moral is this. <laughs> the moral is not don't be a whore. The moral is that all the people that are calling her a whore are, mean. are hypocrites. They're worse than me. Yeah. They're full of shit. Yeah, yeah. That part. So then why, what argument might they be making, and again, we're in the realm of argument at this point. What argument might they be making with that A? We like to cancel celebrities, but we're all kind of shitty people. Every, human, humans as a set, like. It kind of, yeah, it kind of points out that, yeah, we, we all might point at a given person for a given thing, but that supposes that we're above those failings, right? That supposes that we don't ever mess up, you know, or whatever. Yeah, good. And it evokes that with that A. That's it. And if you haven't read the book or if you're otherwise unfamiliar, that will pass you by. And that's okay. That is okay. But the point here is, if you're at all familiar with the book, it's almost like, a, and I hate using this term, but it's almost like a little Easter egg, right? Like a little literary Easter egg. What's the effect of that? Again, we've said what the argument is and what they're trying to do, but what we're really focused on, what's the effect of just like hiding a little thing in the graphic that only some people 
will really pick up on. Why do that? Yeah, we're just trying to define how that works. You're for sure correct. It makes some kind of connection. Yes, but in what way? I mean, in a sense, it adds credibility. It kind of shows that he can, or the editor. I mean, yeah. let's be real. It's multiple people. Yeah, that kind of know what they're talking about. <clears throat> Why? Um, I mean, anybody who kind of went to high school and has somewhat of an education. I say somewhat. Yeah, be careful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, for the most part, you kind of allude to it, but... Yeah, so so it shows there's some level of education just in the works mm -hmm. with the show, right? They've read a book, basically. Mm -hmm. What's the effect of that? These people are kind of literary. What's the effect of that, generally? You get validity in the show that they're putting in more. Like, they could have just put the word public in. Yeah, they're putting like... More effort in. There's layers, good, good. It shows they worked on it, it shows they thought about it, they spent time on it. We're for sure thinking about credibility in that case. And then you add to the fact that it's a literary allusion with an A, not an I, that's a magic trick. Um, which, at least I hope is still the case. When you seem educated, I'm not saying you are, but when you seem educated, usually people tend to value your opinion more, right? You know what you're talking about. Great. The other thing I would add here, because I do want to move on to talk about other things. The effect of the Easter egg itself. I cannot think of another example. Can anybody think of like an Easter egg? Do you guys know what that is? I keep throwing that term around like you know what that is. Like in the image or just in general? Like a, yeah, yeah, like a thing that's hidden in another thing. Like the FedEx logo. Like literally, like Easter eggs are hidden on Easter Day. Well, yeah, but he called an Easter egg when like a thing is hidden in a game or a movie or a show. The point I'm making is, it's a little, almost like piece of trivia, that if you, again, if you're not familiar with the book, you would maybe go, why is that A different? And then you wouldn't think about it anymore. Yeah, I did not think about it. That's fine. But if you are familiar with the book, you have this nice little moment where... All the things you're talking about with credibility for sure come into play, for sure. But also, I would go further and say, you feel good about you. You know what I mean? Like it just, in a very, very small way, it validates you reading that book. You're like, I knew it, man. right? I don't care what anybody says, we all feel good about knowing things. We all feel good when something in the world like kind of taps us on the shoulder and goes, you're not an idiot. Right? Like it, I think that, that's a rhetorical effect on some people. Cool. All right. Um, ooh, I can't see it far. Mm -hmm. we'll, watch, we'll watch more of this at a certain point, and we might zoom around if we have time. But I want to ask you guys. I wanted to save time for this. We only have 20 minutes now. When you watched the clip, hoping you did, um, anything stand out to you guys? other than what we've talked about right here at the top. There's a couple big moments, I would assume, stuck out to you. But I'm just curious if, you, if we use our memories for a second. I mean, the fact that he had an interview, like he set up like an entire interview uh -huh. with like this person that they talk about. Who does he interview? Interviews, uh, what happened? Monica Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. Does he really? Yes. Oh, wait. No. I, I knew that. Yeah. I watched it. This okay. is, um... All right. Uh, my eyes are closed. Show of hands. How many people watched the 25-minute video? How many people we have? Uh, Just me! Oh, shit. I just came from a former Jew. I didn't even show the class. There are two people. Yeah. There's right. between zero and five. You can put your hands. You can put your hands down. I mean, it is funny, but it's not. Sorry, it's all good. I mean, look. On the one hand, I get it. I do. I do. You had a paper due Friday night. You had party Sunday night. You know, apparently, or whatever the fuck. Um, on the one hand, I get it. I do. On the other hand, is 
least 25 in the video. Fuck. Like, you know what I'm saying? And look, look, I'm, I'll come at you like this. Wherever you go after this class, you know, we may awkwardly uh, see each other occasionally, and you won't look at me, and I'll look at you for a second and go, oh, they're not looking at me, that's fine. And I'll, you know, that's fine. But wherever you go after this, whatever classes you have, in a lot of those, they're gonna ask you to do more than watch a 25 minute video. Like it's not gonna get much easier than this. And I, the way I would spin it to you is, as a student, and that is what this is, like for most of you at least, I imagine this is your first semester. Part of your first year, but especially the first semester, is figuring out the kind of student you are versus the kind of student you wanna be. You gotta be able to watch a 20 minute video. You just have to. Even if, and look, I know some people's lives are different. Maybe you work this weekend, or maybe whatever. Okay, it's a 20 minute video. <laughs> like, I, I think you can do it. I really do. I really do. I have kids. They're fucking crazy. I watch football all weekend. I'm not saying that's a woe is me. That's saying I found time to watch a 20 minute video. <laughs> Okay. You know, I just, you got to do that, man. You got to make it happen. All right. Uh, yeah, he does. He does interview Monica Lewinsky. Uh, it's a good interview, too, I think. I guess we'll find out what you think later. But uh, I think it's pretty good. It's pretty telling. She is, uh, if you don't know, pretty famously, uh, um, I think it's fair to say, like a victim of public shaming, right? And it's weird, it's weird to think about, especially because, again, relatively speaking, it was a long time ago, right? But I, I was alive for it. I remember it happening, uh, however old I was. Um, but if you don't know, I'll give you a little bit of backstory because it will help, even though he gives it in the, the video. She famously... <clears throat> almost certainly had a sexual affair with uh, the President of the United States. She was an intern. He was President of the United States. Um, I think, I think she was like 20 or something. Maybe early 20s. Mm -hmm. So like she was 22. Okay, what, yeah, she's around your age. You know, maybe a couple years older. And even at the time, I mean, they, they impeached his ass and like tried to, you know, do all this stuff. But anytime you heard the story talked about, it's the Monica Lewinsky scandal, and she talks about this in, in her interview with, uh, with Oliver. Yeah. Her name was only familiar, which is, I'm pretty sure her name is mentioned in like any other movie song. That's the only reason I heard about it. Well, they talk about it in the video, actually. She's apparently referenced in it. He, he's gonna say at one point, like 190 rap songs or something. Yeah. So, but you gotta think, what is she famous for? And it's like, oh, fuck, okay. That's, it's rough. And she lived through a super rough, you can almost unequivocally say, sexist uh, public shaming. <clears throat> and toward the end of this video, he's gonna talk to her for, for like a, a good little bit about that and like what it is to live through that, what it feels like, which I think is important. If we're thinking about critique, you know, what is uh, his message in the video? He wants to talk about public shaming, why it's good, why it's bad. He's gonna do that for most of the video. But at the end, he's gonna actually sit down and have you, try to have you anyway, uh, hear from a person who was at the heart of it. And I think there's reasons for that that I suppose we can talk about at a later date. Um, but any and all that is worth considering when you do watch the video. Fuck my life. Um, all right, anyway, for next time, I guess. <clears throat> Let's see, I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. Yeah, yeah, okay. So all you have to do, um, Joe Rogan Podcast. It's a little bit complicated because it's on Spotify now. Um, I assume most of you maybe have Spotify already. If you don't, setting up an account is free, okay? And it's, you know, more or less just like another Apple Podcast type thing. Like it's not... It's one more app that you can put on your phone. Uh, or, as crazy as this is, Spotify also has a website. You can do it on a computer. That's kind of weird, but you can totally do it. OK? 
okay? Uh, the important things to know. Once you set up an account, if you need to, you go and find the Joe Rogan podcast. That will not be difficult, right? Um, the episode we're talking about, uh, I have a link on Course Den. I don't think it will work super well unless you are already logged into Spotify, so you might have to navigate that for a second. Um, but it's with a guy named David Pakman, who was also um, sort of at the heart of a little bit of public shaming for a minute. Uh, and they're going to talk about that. It's a really interesting conversation. The important thing for you, timestamps, I mentioned them a couple times, on the syllabus. I don't remember them because they are numbers. I'm not going to remember that. Um, but it's listed on the syllabus. Uh, it starts like around 30 minutes into the podcast, I think, thereabouts, and it goes for about a half hour, right? Use those timestamps. That's all you're required to listen to, okay? It's about a half hour. The other thing I'll say, I keep saying listen to because it's a podcast. That's how they work. There's also a video component. I'm not requiring that. You don't have to sit and watch it. Uh, not least of which because, as we've covered, that seems to be difficult. Um, that, that was a shot. That was a shot. Um, but I will say there is a video component. Um, and if you think you might write a paper about the, the Rogan episode, that's just more ammunition for you. So like not just what they say and how they say it, which is for sure on the table, but if you watch the video, they're in his old studio, he's got this big table with a bunch of random shit on it, and you can see how they both look and how their posture, which we I wanted to talk about today, like the way he's dressed or his set looks very like night show-ish, right? Um, this is a, a particular sort of vibe Right? The Rogan podcast, especially if you look at the video, uh, very different vibe. And I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, but again, that part's up to you. You don't have to watch the thing. Listening to it is fine. Uh, but if you think you might write about it, watching it just makes your job even easier. So that's what you got to do for next time. And I suppose watch this video too. <laughs> Um, and other than that, I'll see you Wednesday. Sweet. I'll see you Wednesday. Thank you guys.